everybody. I'm Marianne Monaj, and I am here today with my co-host Benjamin Rosenbaum, and we're going to have two guest authors today, Delia Sherman and Ellen Kushner, and we're going to try doing something new for us. We'll interview Delia first, then Ellen, and then we're going to interview them together, um, which I think you're going to find a lot of fun. So we're going to start with Delia. Delia is the author of a host of novels. Um, through the, through the Brazen Mirror, The Porcelain Dove, The Fall of the Kings, which she co-wrote with Ellen, Changeling, Magic Mirror of the Mermaid Queen, The Freedom Maze, which has won um, multiple awards, the, um, um, the Prometheus Award and the Andre Norton Award, and her most recent novel, The Evil Wizard, Smallbone. She has a collection, Young Woman in a Garden and Other Stories, and she's also edited a bunch of stuff. So there's many things we could talk to her about. Um, one of the things I wanted to start with was talking about um, changing genres because Delia has written in several different genres and for several different um, ages. Um, so maybe you could just start with telling us a little bit about how you got, got into the field, started writing fiction. Um, maybe we'll start with Through a Brazen Mirror and kind of go from there, if that makes sense. Well, I really started as a short story writer, not mm -hmm. because um, I'm a natural short story writer, which I am not, um, but because I found novels um, a little overwhelming, which mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes I still do because I have a tendency to write long. Um, when I when I started in the, the the profession, that was really where you did start anyway. It was was by selling short fiction, and I cannot. I am very bad at plot. I I can never think of a a situation that 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 does not always end up with two people in a room talking to each other. Uh, I <laughs> am not grouping. <laughs> yeah, and probably coming out with the same opinions with which they went in. So I need. <laughs> and, and I stole them. From um, from ballads mostly, mm -hmm. um, so I I wrote various takes on things like the maid on the shore and um, and and the the the, uh, the the Bonnie maid of Anglesey and all mm -hmm. putting them a lot of them I placed in America a lot of them I placed in um, in history uh, and and so I was just playing with where and what I wanted to write about on the framework mm -hmm. of existing narratives so I, I also did some fairy tale. Uh, but my first novel started out as a short story. Uh, it was on the famous flower of serving men, which is a, a traditional British ballad that was actually written by Martin Carthy. And it was it was it, it, it's two ballads bolted together because they are both he, he took two ballad fragments and wove them together and added a few verses. And that is the famous flower of serving men. And it's a it's a really interesting ballad because it's got magic in it. It's got the fairy court. It's got ghosts. It's got doves. It has, um, you know, magical deer um, and it has a king who falls in love with his steward. And he, who is a woman, and we know from the beginning it's a woman because it, because the ballad is is her story, but it's at the end at the end of the ballad, you know, he he kisses her in front of the entire court, and the court is going ah, oh! and, <laughs> and he, you know she she announces, you know, it's okay, I'm a girl, and they <laughs> live happily ever after. And I thought, well, what if he were disappointed? Uh, <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I mean, convenient and everything, but uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's the book I wanted to write, and wow. I, um, and yeah. I wrote it. I wrote it. Lar it's her story, but I didn't tell it from her point of view. It was it was all told from the points of view of people who were looking at her, rather than from her point of view. Um, and it was really, it was a very, and, and I, so I, I, I turned this thing in to Jane Yolen and um, she looked at it and she said, because I was taking a course with her at Smith College that was, it was a 
um, <sighs> writing course. It was the only writing course I ever took. It was like <laughs> one week. And uh, uh, that was when I met her, which was the best thing I ever did. I know. Life. I'm super jealous I mean, right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a, a, apart from marrying Ellen, it was the best meeting of all. <laughs> and she said, you're a real writer. This is, this is, this is wonderful and you should finish it, but it's not a short story. It's a novel. And I said, <laughs> I don't write novels. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that that makes me you know i feel like there's an entire subgenre i don't know like a, a, a set of these fiction that is based on fairy tales and folklore and ballads right there was a, a series for a little while that i think terry windling was am i remembering this right that was editing um that i i think i submitted something to and didn't get in i was very disappointed because that was a beautiful series um series of books tam lynn is in that series right um, yeah. pamela dean's yeah. tam lynn yeah. um which is based on a a ballad so i almost feel like that could be a, a conventional panel topic at some point it'd be really interesting talking about what happens when we take these these ballads and we um adapt them and remake them and bring queer perspectives all kinds of other perspectives to them you know and even things like um the ramayana has been reworked over and over and over again and so there's movies like sita sings the blues which is like this oh, yeah. animated take on it um and i don't know i, I just think it's a it's a f very rich realm for where i have to tell you i i the only time I've done this successfully was with Tam Lin and it was writing porn for a, a porn magazine. Um, <laughs> but it was really fun <laughs> taking uh, this character and like, you know, running him through many possibilities um, that were probably not envisioned in the original story. <laughs> right. So. Although you uh, never know what got cut. So. Well, that's From yeah the no there versions. maybe well, I, I mean <laughs> yes I mean and also panky and like in the in the court <laughs> no and if they're you know the folk tradition is what it is and you know maybe there are many versions out there that never made it down to us and uh, I just taught my students Goblin Market and I had forgotten how smutty that story that poem is um, oh. Rosetti's the Goblin Market and I was like I was a little shocked I was like I gave this to my students and I was like you know this is part of <laughs> Am I gonna get classical fired? English literature <laughs> and you know have fun guys because it's very sexy um and and someone sensual. we prefer sensual 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 yes so yeah I, I don't know I think it goes even beyond sensual I, I'm not sure but um okay so that was sorry that was a long well, tangent it, just, just to touch on 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 mythic fiction mm -hmm. um they're originally urban fantasy was fairies come to the modern world mm -hmm. and a lot of it was had fairy tale roots not just in the characters but also in the deep structure mm -hmm. and uh, back back in the day back in the 60s and the 70s um, there were a lot of fantasy writers um, who were who were work and, and even science fiction writers who were working on that deep structure of, of fairy tale and and folklore, and mm -hmm. I th and there and and you know Charles Delint made an mm -hmm. entire career out of it and and continues to do so, um, and so do and and Charles Vess was was also part mm -hmm. of it and has both he, he's he's been writing for a while but he's just starting to get published and and all of his stuff is informed by that terry certainly um right. Dory snyder um i can you know there's there's a whole list of us who who were really part of that that mythic that mythic movement uh, so that, I'm, I'm gonna make a note here just because so we're one of the things we're hoping to do with this podcast is um use pieces of it for a um, like Khan Academy, but for creative writing, a, a set of free lessons, units, whatever that people can use either to study on their own or I in the classroom. Too, you know. Sorry? <laughs> I have yeah. taught too. Well, I know, I know, but I'm, I'm just thinking I'm, I'm gonna, Darius, if you can remind me to circle back around with Delia about putting together this mythic unit, we maybe we can maybe even pay you a little bit to help us with it. Um, not very much because we're a nonprofit, but um, but in any case, like I think this would be a great segment that we could uh, we could do anyway. Sorry, that was a another side note, but it's it's very rich material, and um, in the sense that I, I almost want to contrast it with 
tell me if this is fair. Ben, Ben kind of gets cranky sometimes when I talk about formulaic fiction. So, um, but I, I do. you do actually. Well, um, I want to hear know, more you, about when that. We had the whole, <laughs> well, we had that whole conversation about good writing, bad writing. You know. Ah. Anyway, um, and the feels like a different category than formulaic. But go on. Well, <laughs> yes. Well, okay. So, but <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is. Uh, I think I've, one of my critiques of formulaic fiction, which I do on occasion read and enjoy, I've, you know, there are times when I get into a, a headspace where I'm very happy to read a sequence of popcorn novels that are all basically the same thing, right? Um, when I'm very tired, I might want, like, there are, I don't want to dismiss romance authors by this, so it's, it, this happens everywhere in every genre, right? And it, and westerns mystery whatever um but in in romance you might have like here is the the harlequin formula right and it's very satisfying you come in knowing what you're going to get um mm -hmm. you work through certain paces and then you come out at the end right and what i i, I guess i want to contrast that with this kind of mythic fiction just because the the formulaic stuff if it stays formulaic it tends to be kind of shallow as opposed to the There's, depth here, is I guess what is that fair? That's because there is no formula to um, to to do folklore. <clears throat> there are certain. I mean, people have tried to reduce a lot of things to a formula. You have this Dith Thompson folklore index, where you know you you you. This is tale number tale type forty two point mm -hmm. six sub paragraph B. Um, yeah. But, but and if you have that kind of mind, yes, of course, it's this big. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the folk <laughs> he has to be so specific and maybe right. there's one tale that's like that. Yeah. Um, it's not. Whereas the formula, especially a Harlequin romance or one of the silhouette romances, they set out your outline, and what mm. you did was you plugged in the names and the positions, and, and <laughs> but it it really was the kiss on it. It really kind of is the kiss on page six, and that mm. is wanting the formula as before. It's tremendously comforting. Mm -hmm. It's it's tremendously um, you know your your mind is out. You, you just want to have your eyes moving across a page, reading something that's not going to challenge you and that is simply going to deliver you what it is that you want. And there's, and, 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 th and that's not a value judgment. That's, mm -hmm. but that it does it better than anything else on earth. And I think a lot of people think that fairy tales are like that because they know five fairy tales and, <laughs> and, they, have, and they have chosen the fairy tales, not only that Disney cho chose to make movies of, or, you know, mm -hmm. somebody else chose to make movies of, but they have also chosen the, 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 the one they, they have chosen the Disney version and he tended mm -hmm. to Disneyfy everything so that mm -hmm. you do that Bambi's really the only one that 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 absolutely breaks that mold mm -hmm. because it doesn't actually I mean it doesn't have um it doesn't have a a, a a Noah's Ark happily ever after ending and and it's not just because it's an animal tale it doesn't really have a happy ending in you know there was there was no and they lived happily ever after mm. um but the whole business of about, you know, boy goes on quest, gets girl um, as part of quest, brings her home, gets the, 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 um, gets the kingdom and the girl and lives happily ever after. That's, there, there, there are only a handful of tales that, 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 that do that. And most mm -hmm. of them are much more complicated, much more nuanced. Um, even when, the, even the simplest ones are more complicated than that. And mm -hmm. a lot of them are headed up by women who go on quests and, and, you know, find their guy. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them, there's there's one where the girl goes on the quest and brings back the princess and the princess and, and then gets basically goes trans <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, the get gets because they they love each other so much and clearly they can't do it as two women so she turns into a guy um, that's though people don't know about those and yeah as you read more as you read more deeply in the in the literature you can find these things that 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 make it completely clear that if you are writing mythological folk folklore based fiction you are not writing to any kind of formula mm -hmm. there is no formula it's, there there that are might be a good there there are there are predictable structures but there is no mm -hmm. formula mm. 
Yeah, well, I th- yeah. and I wanted to say like that structure thing was where I was going to go because, you know, when I'm teaching a basic creative writing class, I will often start the students with here's a fairy tale structure that you can that you're familiar with that will that will result in a satisfying story, right? Someone goes on a quest, they hit the first obstacle, they meet it. Second obstacle is higher, harder. They meet that. Third obstacle is the climax. And then they either succeed or fail. And then we have the denouement, the resolution, right? Like, so, you know, the prince or princess, whomever, right? There's, you know, three tests, right? And the tests get harder and harder. Um, but that's a that's a very basic, I, I don't know, I guess I'm interested in this question of like, is there a distinction between formula and structure there? And you know, in part, you know, Pixar has like, you know, <laughs> things they put out about this. And I, I think a lot of writers are looking for well, a map. Sure. They, right? they are, but they're, but there are many different maps. And, and yeah. I mean, I can always tell when a student has read um, um, uh, Save the Cat because mm-hmm. they write the same, you know, they, they, they're, they're <laughs> writing formula fiction. They're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the structure is what they're focused on more than anything else. And so you get this, I, and I feel like, I feel like a lot of action movies are extremely formulaic and they <laughs> are based on this kind of thing. Uh, the 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 ones that are formulaic are based on this kind of of idea that you know you've got this you've got the try fail loop you've got all of this stuff that pe- beats you have to hit the beat here and the beat there and it's useful to talk about it's a it's a good servant it's a very poor master mm, right. yeah yeah and um, it seems to me like like any art is balanced between familiarity and surprise right so like our brains like complexity and complex like if everything is literally identically the same then we already you know then i mean it's comfort to, to reread the same story but you know it's it's uh we don't there any everyone something there's there's a degree of repetition which is monotonous for any human right mm-hmm. and there's a degree of novelty which is bewildering for any human and then you know there's you you may be in a taste for more comfort or more or more challenge but there's also like what also, the art is composed of multiple things, and often the point is that the thing you're interested in you want to vary, and the thing you're not interested in you you want to be familiar. So, in fact, a lot of those things that are like save the cat, hit the beats, if they really, it, it's it's sort of flat and boring if all they care about is plot and they're doing these beats and you've seen them before. But if actually what they care about is all the witty repartee and the cool, you know, and that, then it, then then hanging it on this very predictable structure, we're like, okay, now Dark Knight of the Soul is actually satisfying because it showcases all the stuff the story is actually mm-hmm. about and gives it a, a structure to lie on. It's like a sonnet, you know what right. I mean? Like, or something. It's like, you know, right. you, you, exactly. we know yeah. the beats, so that allows us to not worry about the beats so then we can actually see the thing you're trying to show us. Whereas if you want it to be, if it's Tarantino movie, the whole point is to throw out the expectation. Like you thought this guy was a hero? No, he's dead. You know what I mean? Now we're somewhere else. I don't know what's going on. I mean, he has, he has his own, he has his own deep structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. and, and it also comes from, from history and literature. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if somebody comes up with something that's absolutely original, it's, unbe- it's, yeah. it's unreadable. I try to write. now can read well yeah. people some people <laughs> not me uh can now read like U- ulysses and um uh, mm-hmm. the, the other one that oh Finnegan Finnegan Twake Twake or... um because they have learned how to read it the, but yeah, you yeah. have to learn you have yeah, to learn yeah. how to read that particular text right and and so and exactly because you're always reading in terms of conventions and whenever anybody innovates they're always have to teach um and i've had that Problem. I mean, I, one of the best writing advice I ever got was from Charlie Finlay, where I had written a story which I was hewing as closely as possible to the structure of the Bible, which is, you know, of a biblical verse. And he was like, so readers don't know how to read this, so you have to teach them. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen's you, you walked into to, the background. Ellen's, just, Ellen's in the background. So, yeah. so, so the idea that you have to, like, teach the reader the conventions that you're going to use before you... Um, yeah. Before yeah. You, I, it, you're making them. me think about... Um, I don't know. I wonder if there's also a time when you're like ready for surprise or wanting surprise or what happens when, the, you know, so, so Jed and I disagree, or disagree is maybe not the right word about frozen <laughs> because um, I, I love it. I feel like in frozen, you have this setup where Anna, the princess meets this prince and they fall instantly in love. And then 
Elsa, her sister, is like, you can't marry this guy. You just met him. And it's it's such a disruption mm-hmm. of the Disney fairy tale princess yeah. marriage narrative. Um, uh, I, I felt mm-hmm. like it elevated Disney movies. Sure. Like it took them to a new level and I really opened things up and I, I love what they did with it. Jed can acknowledge that, but on some level, it still bothers him because he had bought into the convention and he was looking mm. for the, you know, happy ending. And he was very like, he was, he had already invested in the romance and then huh. to have that yanked away from him um, was frustrating. And it reminds me of, I was talking to a friend recently about my best friend's wedding, the movie with um, Julia Roberts, which does the same thing like it it's a uh, i'm sorry if people aren't familiar but it's it's a whole <laughs> conventional romance spoiler novel. warnings yeah, the, well, this the... is, yeah this is a, this is this is a major spoiler. spoilers for frozen and my best friend wedding in yeah, this episode because julia roberts like she's done a lot of conventional fairly conventional romance novel plots and this one is the one where you go and you're madly in love with your um with your ex and you go to proclaim your love and break up his wedding and traditionally he would realize you were really you guys were meant to be and this movie was actually about her realizing at the very end that she was being selfish and that he and the woman he was about to marry were good for each other and um (laughs) And it's I I watched it not knowing this was what it was going to be and had this sort of moment of like wait what and then I was like oh that's better that's so grown up that's so like it's it takes it up a level in terms of acknowledging the real complexity of human relationships so I don't know I'm not sure what my point is so here I think either. what you're talking about is hewing and this is what which 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 we're now going to turn into a question for Delia okay which is hewing to structures and then like deconstructing or playing with structures like because one Mm -hmm. thing you can satisfyingly do for a reader is to say we're going to hit this beat and the other thing you can satisfyingly do is to say we're gonna nope yeah (laughs) right you thought it was gonna be this beat and now i've turned everything upside down so is that do you consciously think about that in in well first we were talking about sort of steep structures this folkloric mode that you started out in uh, or this mytho poetic mode maybe I'm muddying those terms. How do you think about that in terms of um, emulating and also in terms or inhabiting and also in terms of like playing with or undoing or or taking apart, um, you know? For, for me, structure comes quite a long way in the rear of most of my other writing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I, I pay attention to it in the last draft. Um, mm. and, well, not the last draft because the last draft <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still yeah. dealing with commas. Um, mm-hmm. But when when I do pay attention to structure, it is after I have I have gotten a lot of other things out of the way first, like the characters and their relationships and how they how they they interact mostly with history, because almost every right thing I write now has got a historical framework. Um, Mm -hmm. So, and I am very, I'm, I am the kind of person who can't say, well, it would be really convenient for my plot if I had these things that happened two years, you know, that, 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 that instead of being Mm -hmm. in, in, um, in, in, in Vienna in, in 19, in, in March of 1920, so-and-so was Mm -hmm. in Vienna in, in, in April of 1931, I, you know, they had, I have to follow history. So, Mm -hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And right now, I'm I'm working on a book on that's set during the Franco-Prussian War, the siege of Paris, and the Commune, um, which all happened with within less than a year. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it, it's it's kind it was kind of an exciting time mm-hmm. in, in in French history. But and and sometimes I just wish something had happened a week later because it's so hard to. <laughs> but it's hard on my characters, and that's what I wanted to write yeah. about. I wanted to write yeah. about people who had lives and then history came along and fucked it up mm, so yeah. they and i are having the same problem <laughs> uh-huh, which is a good sign i think that's that's so interesting i i, I i'm thinking of guy gabriel k he avoids that right because he, well, he uses yeah, he, he uses yeah, historical yeah, settings yeah. and yeah. um but he he you know fictionalizes it just enough to give him some room to play um and i think that's a, it's an interesting choice as an author how 
how invested you are in the specifics. I, I, you know, I do feel like your books are very, it's, it's interesting that you say you find the structure towards the end, because I, I think of them as very satisfying in, in, in a way that like they are well structured. They don't feel like <laughs> I worked just, on it. You did. <laughs> well, you know, well, no, but I guess what I think I is interesting is that it. You're, the, it, it gives me hope that you're able to do that at a later stage and not at the beginning, because it you know, it like depends I, on how your brain is put together. I know, yeah, because mm. I think sometimes I I have a hard time working to a structured plot outline. I lose interest in the story, and so when I'm trying to write a novel, you know, I actually did do this. I hate to say I did. The, I think the save the cat thing is the, you know, you have your protagonist save the cat at the beginning, and it creates instant reader sympathy. Right? Is that the that was the idea? I heard a romance a novelist talk about this uh, panel at one point and I love her books. I think they're they're very satisfying and I hadn't quite noticed that she, it was a dog in her case, like her protagonist always saves the dog at the start of the novel. <laughs> and I was like, this is awesome. I will do this too. And so when I started writing my first, like I'm writing a science fiction novel, I had her save a, a fuzzy alien, in fact, um, in the first scene. And that was, it worked. But then I, I don't know, I ended up drafting the whole book and I, multiple drafts and I got to a point where I was like I don't need this anymore like this was a useful convention to get me over my hump and mm -hmm. like give me a little structure for yeah, starting to write and so on but now I don't know that it still serves the book and it feels a little um I don't know like forced like a you know like a, does that make sense I don't know cheap cheap yeah there's yeah. a here somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. As cheap as I think actually the word, like it felt like I wasn't fair to my readers. I don't know, but it's, it's funny. Cause I do in fact love, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name. She wrote welcome to temptation and she manages to use this in a, her books are often kind of funny. And so even if you notice that she's doing this, it's all right. It's like part of the, but I think, does that you know, make I think sense? in a way that the P the, 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 just to throw this out there, I feel like the difference between part of the difference between formula and deep structure is actually psychological and has to do with the author, because mm -hmm. in some ways, if you are doing it with the part of your brain, that's like, OK, well, what do I do? Oh, oh this is the page where I have to. Oh, OK, so uh, I guess a fuzzy alien then. OK, you know what I mean? If you're sort of the strategizing conscious part of your brain is the one that's running the show when you're following these beats, then it's formula. You're like cramming mm -hmm. the things into and it's a superficial engagement. The author who you're talking about where I mean, I've never, it's a hilarious idea that her every protagonist in the beginning of every book saves a dog and it totally works like that could be the case if for that author that is just so deeply inherently satisfying to her core mm -hmm. that it's like it isn't formulaic it's like literally what she wants to introduce every protagonist with because it's <laughs> like this recurring motif that like saving uh... the dog means echoes within her soul like then it you know and so it's right uh, yeah I mean it has a lot to do with whether for you it's cheap you know whether yeah. you're just importing it from somewhere else or whether it's your deep relationship so so but I want to get back to that question. So the historicals, that makes sense. That's very interesting that you're engaging with, um, you know, what, you know, you're, you're finding, you know, okay, this actually happened on this day. So therefore I have to weave the structure of what I want to happen around it. But in a lot of your, your work, it's not like that. Like, I mean, the Freedom Maze yeah. is historical, but it, 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 it's very private family history. So you could essentially, in, in, you know, uh, invent the events and the order and so oh, yeah. on. Um, and do you, so, so in that case, I guess that's one question is, are you just sort of discovering it as you go along? Like, that's a good example for it. Like for, so for that book, how did you, what did you start with and how did you what find I your way through with, it? And when did you what, get the structure? What I started with was a dream. Um, I, I, I dreamed that I was sitting in the window seat in my house in Newton, Massachusetts. And <clears throat> when I was looking out on a garden that wasn't mine mm -hmm. and there was a maze in it and mm -hmm. I was reading a book. Hmm. And I and in, in the dream, I know that that it was disappearing under my eyes as I read. And that was, you know, it, it was one of those dream things. But mm -hmm. the, the thing that really stuck with me was the sense of a presence that was, I mean, a, a physical presence that was behind me and I couldn't see that was telling me that what I was looking at was really important and I better pay attention to it. Hmm. So um, I started I started trying to figure out what the what what that character was and what she mm. was doing there and what the maze mm -hmm. meant. And there was a lot of stuff going on on Boston because I started this years and years and years and years long before it was published. Yeah. Um, because it was too hard. It was too, 
a number of things. Um, Uh, I'm I'm just going to interject for people that um, who aren't familiar with the Freedom Maze that the basic story, right, is uh, uh, actually maybe Delia should do the basic story. Yeah, I don't want. No, but uh, yeah, yeah. What would you what would you say to people about the book without spoilers, just to frame what we're talking about it's, here? It's a it's a story. It's a story about a girl who goes back in time to learn how not to be a a, a racist. <laughs> right, but she's also. Yeah. But she's yeah. She but she goes. She's a. Sorry, I've read this and I'm, my she's, everything is falling a, out of my head. She's she's a she's black a girl. girl. She's a white girl, and she goes back into a uh, into, into Louisiana, the, and she basically becomes a slave on her grandparents' plantation. Right. Yes. And so, um, so it's a a potentially incredibly fraught topic. And I, I will tell you, Delia, when I saw this book was coming out, um, I had this this moment of fear, like real fear, that like. Oh my God! I love Delia's novels. I love Delia. I think she's the best. She's, she's going to get in trouble. She's going <laughs> to well, more like, what if she messed this up really badly, yeah, and I have to be yeah. the one to say to her, you know, like mm-hmm. you've you've done this terrible racist thing. And thankfully, I did not. You know, she didn't, it, no, and uh, she did an well, amazing job I, with I, it. But I, it was such a it was a, a tough thing to take on. I guess I I had I had Aliyah Johnson, Tempest uh, Bradford, um, and and Nora uh, uh. to <laughs> tell me that beforehand if I had done. It. Okay. <laughs> Phew. And, and right. One of my Clarion students, who was a um, who was a, um, uh, a, a a priest of I can't remember who, but but he's he 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 is in fact a, a Voodoo priest and 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 Cam Roberts. So I was I was covered. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Which is which is actually a really I think important lesson because and that is sort of something we've touched on before at various times, which is like having the connections and the people who you can go to and it's like a lot of like it's it's ticking on fraught topics like that it's like if you of course you're going to get them wrong but that can be a first draft problem the beauty of Mm -hmm. of of you know of writing and being able to revise is that you can and if you have built those relationships then you have that uh you know then you have a bigger more than just your own mind working on the problem it was it was really it it is also the most autobiographical novel i have ever written in in Mm -hmm. in clearly not in in event detail but emotionally and um the only argument that i got into with nora was that she said a mother would never treat her daughter like that and i just smiled at her and i said well sorry to burst that bubble for you honey (laughs) there you go (laughs) this one i know more about than you do yes yes yeah oh that's fascinating yeah it's a very interesting sort of there was this very interesting kind of um uh part of what's really interesting about it is also what's happening in the present of the book like before the time travel which is the 1950s and it's a very sort of there's it for a modern reader you know for my kids reading it it's like two time travel books because on the one (laughs) hand it's the the world of slavery in the 1860s but on the other hand it's like the like incredibly byzantine rules of femininity in the 1950s too is mm-hmm. is like a lot of what's going on and so it's it's uh and i mean there, this is early in the book so it's not a spoiler but it's kind of fascinating that the way by which the the the, the protagonist ends up in the situation is that in 1860 of course everybody is like you know under umbrellas and you know they're 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 all as white as possible <laughs> and then in 1950 she's like living this tomboy life out of out from under her mother's thumb with her her you know aunt who uh is is does not have the same uh set of gender uh norms and <laughs> you know so she's running around in the swamp getting tan and so when she go you know and and in in and in a disheveled you know, outfit, which, you know, would not be the pinafore and hoop skirt. Yeah. So when she shows up, the easiest place to slaughter her into is that she's, is that she must she be sort of. she looks just like the family. Yeah, she looks just like the family. And it, it, right, that's the other beauty. It, it, if a random kid shows up with a tan who looks just like the wayward brother and hasn't been announced to the family, that is definitely not, you know, then the, the family has an easy explanation for how that could have happened. It does not, it does not at all puzzle them how this kid uh, mm-hmm. is there. The, the other important the other important seed for that novel was when I was doing I mean I, I had this idea and I thought well you know this is really too far-fetched and I need to, to think of another way of doing of telling the story and then I went to do some research at Loyola and I and they gave me a, a, a folder full of 
um, full of advertisements for escaped slaves. Mm -hmm. And I found one that said blonde and blue eyed could pass as white. And mm -hmm. I found two or three others where, you know, two, two escaped slaves were, were they, they were looking for two people who had, had gone together and that, it, that, that one could pass as white and the other one pa was passing as his body servant. So mm -hmm. this was not unusual. And it really yeah. brought home to me that, that race in this particular way was, a, was entirely an, an economic and cultural construct that, mm -hmm. that it had absolutely nothing to do with the color of your skin it had to do mm -hmm. with and class um but did that, but that, did that was, novel get taught a lot i think i i, I guess I'm i asking, have no idea <laughs> it seems like such a useful text for getting younger people to start thinking about race mm. as a construct yeah. right you know and uh, i would love to see it in classrooms kind of across so the country yeah yeah okay <laughs> anyone heard. any teachers listening we're gonna make a module yeah. about this because I, I think it, it would be a, an ideal kind of thing to use um i i did i did a great deal of i did a great deal of research on it and i did a great deal of original research because you know i re for one thing i was brought up as a scholar and mm -hmm. for and i'm i even i'm a terrible critic <laughs> but I'm a really, really good researcher. <laughs> um, unfortunately, now research has gotten harder for me because my skills are no longer current. I, I know how mm. to use a library and I know, yeah. I, I know my way around, you know, paper, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not I, I, I find the internet very difficult to do research on. I, I mm. go down, rab I go down useless rabbit holes mm -hmm. that, 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 tell that finally end up telling me nothing I don't know mm. and it's it's very it, it's it's very frustrating especially since I haven't been able to get into a library for for mm. 18 months and um some yeah. of the stuff that I need I mean I've got online stuff and if it's yeah. online I can read it but there's stuff that is available that 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 the um that the French haven't I, I do a lot of it, since mm. it's a French novel I'm I'm doing a lot mm -hmm. of and I and I read French. I can I I do a lot of my research there. Um, I I need to go to a library because they haven't put up like the three books that I know yeah. I need to look at. They're yeah. not online. Not uh, yeah, that's fascinating. I, I remember I went to hear Amitav Ghosh speak at the Chicago Humanities Festival, and he talked about how he did his River of Smoke series, which involved going to India to the newspaper archives, to the, you know, uh, what are those machines? Not mimeograph, the- Microfilm. Yes. Microfilm, thank you. Microfilm yeah. machines so and things. reading through all these newspapers <laughs> for months on end. And I was, I was, I was very envious of him because I was, I think, a young parent at the time. And I was like, I never am going to have the time to do that kind of research. Um, but you can see it in the novels. Like he's, he's writing about this war and it's, it's, it's just so clearly embedded in, actual history and these details that are um, so concrete and specific. Um, anyway, uh, we're, we're, I'm trying to keep an eye on time because I could talk to Delia forever, um, but we are not gonna keep you forever. So before we, what we're planning to do is pause and then come back with Ellen and then come back with both of them. But I wanted to touch on with you this um, more of a, a business question about switching from, you know, you've written adult, young adult, middle grade. I mean, the, I think as two separate categories. Um, and I've now only, I think- I've only written middle grade. Only middle grade, okay. And you're, and then now coming back, is your current book adult or middle grade, the one you're working on? Oh, is it ever adult? Okay, <laughs> so, um, so maybe you could just talk a little bit about- maybe. Generous. Maybe why you made the switch initially, I'm kind of interested in, because it does seem like a big jump from adult to middle grade. Um, well, it certainly also, wasn't a business decision. Right, right. So, <laughs> so why did you make the switch and how has it been <laughs> jumping around like this in terms of your career? <laughs> um, I assume um, bad. Um, I assume that's been a bit of a hindrance, um, but- You I know, could, really, I, <laughs> career. I, I am not I am not the kind of person who thinks about my career very much. I just mm -hmm. I want to sell the damn thing. I make it the best way I can, and I have, God bless her, an agent who is willing to 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 follow me and my vagaries. Um, it I the the reason that I switch when I finished 
when I finished Porcelain Dove, it was it took me ten years to write it, um, and it because I did a lot of research and I was teaching myself to write a complex novel, mm-hmm. and and then. I just didn't I just didn't have another idea that I wanted to put that much effort mm. into. What I did have was I started the Freedom Maze. That was that was going to be my next book and I didn't I couldn't I couldn't find my way into it. I couldn't write it. I couldn't find a voice. Um, I was writing it as if it were an adult novel. I kept, you know, going off into talking about the, about Aunt Enid and, you know, what she was doing about this and that and the other <laughs> thing. It just, and that wasn't the book I wanted. There's to a whole other novel in there about Aunt Enid that's under the <laughs> secretly, like, I want to, I want the prequel where Aunt Enid, you know. <laughs> I frankly think that, 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 she, N- never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But anyway, um, I was thinking that, that she as a three dollar bill. Is that what you were gonna? The, 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 oh, yeah, they definitely had a thing with somebody who had just who had died not too long before. But yeah, you know, yeah. A, a, a kid really wasn't going to hear that much about it. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Or or it would have found its way in. Be that as it may, um, I couldn't. <laughs> book it would not lie down and be written so Mm -hmm. the only reason I actually started it was because I was stuck in 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 Maine where my my then partner was teaching at Bates University and I was left home alone all day every day out in the middle of nowhere we were living way out in the woods in a rented house Mm -hmm. and I had nobody to talk to and I heard that there was a writing group for children's books so I started a children's book (laughs) That, that I swear to God, that was the beginning of it. Um, so I, I, des- I decided once I gave up on Freedom Maze, I decided I still wanted to work on a, another, a, a middle grade book because I loved middle grade books. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, it'll be easy. So, and I thought, well, I really miss New York. I was living in Boston at the time. I really miss New York and I want to write something that's got a lot of cultures in it and, and talks about diversity and and deals with a world that is as diverse as I know New York to be and that the New York that I grew up in was. And so I, I wrote a fairy tale. Um, it was, you know, it was kind of, I, I, I just gathered folklore and, and folklore tropes from every place that I put my hand down and appropriated like crazy um, because New York appropriates like crazy and, and thought about the ways in which um, folklore from one, from, from one culture would adapt as immigrants do to the cult, the, the, the dominant culture of New York, which is not really like the culture of any other city in, in America. Uh, so I, that, that was what, that was what Changeling was. And it was, it was just, I really, I, I knew that I knew that certain beats had to be hit. She had to. She had to. Be, she had to be told that there was something that she couldn't do, and then she had to do it. And then there had mm-hmm. to be consequences, and the consequences would be New York consequences. And she would, <laughs> museum, would go to the Metropolitan Museum because I love the Metropolitan Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very much a love song to <laughs> New York and, and Central and she Park. And to have a magical helper, and she and and she needed to have she needed to have a fairy godmother. So I made that a giant rat. And <laughs> it's New York, um, and and I and she had to go to Broadway, and it, mm-hmm. and that, and that was Damon Runyon land. So there were a lot of characters out of Damon Runyon, and really, <laughs> it's it is basically it's it's a um, it it it's a completely what what's Tom Jones where just one thing happens after another. Oh, a um, picaresque. Thank you. It's the picaresque. <laughs> It's a I, I feel pr- I have a moment of student pride here that I have not disappointed my teacher, Delia. Okay, go on. <laughs> I, I, all my life, all, all my life, I have I have been not finding words that I wanted when I oh, needed. I, I, I just hope that if I talked long enough, they would show up. Mm, I, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I was able to pull that one out of wherever. <laughs> There's also a wonderful, um, I mean, that it's very struck a chord with me in Changeling about the way, and it's a very delicate way, and it's not very overt, but there's a delicate way in which the, uh, there's a sort of analogy between, like fairies come across as very neurodiverse. The, 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 the person, the Changeling living in our world 
is sort of expects to act according to a lot of sort of classic fairy tale rules where, you know, they want, they, they need to count all the things and they need the things to be very black and white. And they, and you know, that's that, um, you know, that, uh, it, you know, it's, it's handled very elegantly that these are just two very different ways of being and that they're both completely valid, but that the person, this person in this one world has some, has, you know, is sort of, it works the way that everybody works in the other world, but here they are in this world. And so that's in a way that's kind of a, it's kind of, again, it's a, it's a, it's a brave and fraught topic to take on, but it also is kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a, um, a powerful, like as a kid uh, who feels different from the way that the rest of the world works, maybe that's a very powerful mythic framing of it. Like, uh, I'm kind of like an immigrant, you know what I mean? It, to this world where everybody doesn't work in the in the way that that uh, that I do, and that somebody from this world would be equally perplexed were they to find themselves, you know, in <laughs> in the world where everybody thinks like me. So, you know, um, I I did. I have read a lot, as you can imagine, a lot of fairy tales. Not not as many yeah. as Harry. I mean, there are people who know a lot more about this than I do. <laughs> But it, it really has occurred to me over and over again that, um, that, that, that be, partly because historically speaking, um, when a ch the, the idea of a changeling came when a child did not make sense to the parents or the mm -hmm, culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, I, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was an explanation for crib death because mm -hmm. there is also a whole history of changeling literature that that is they leave a block mm. of of um wood in the child's cradle yeah. and, uh -huh. and you think it's dead but it's it's actually a changeling mm -hmm. um yeah and, you're, and your child is alive in fairy your land. child is mm -hmm. elsewhere yeah um, and there is also the idea that a young child especially you know a very attractive young child um when they start behaving in strange ways is is mm. is no longer human your child is somewhere else yeah 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 and and for for kids who are who do have kind of a an onset of mm -hmm. of their 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 neurodiversity becomes apparent later in mm -hmm. life um this this was a reason to treat them very badly because mm -hmm. they weren't human and yeah. i and and so i wanted to take that from the other way from the mm -hmm. from the the other way and and changeling um is the 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 girl rather than the book um is yeah. much more comfortable in the fairy world than mm -hmm. she was in the outside mm -hmm. world although she misses it because she loves her parents and that's what she's used yeah. to so yeah. she she does get back to it in the end um mm -hmm. and, and that is and that is her happy ending you know mm -hmm. um and and that's not the question you know <laughs> and then, yeah. that, that's <laughs> That's that's not actually a spoiler because that's not what the book is about. <laughs> right, right. Um, but it was. It, but you also have to realize when these books were written. These books were written before identity politics became mm -hmm. as much a part of the national discourse as it is now. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing more. I was I was writing in 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 a cultural vacuum. As far mm. as I knew, there were very mm -hmm. few things that were written across race, across neurodiversity, across, you know, per, pretty much anything. And no, there was, there was, there was some sense, especially in the science fiction community, that you bore a responsibility not to behave like an asshole and parade your, mm -hmm. your, your prejudices and your preconceptions in front of the world, mm -hmm. but and, and to, to, to try to educate yourself about what you were writing about. And yeah. as a responsible scholar, I would feel that I would have to do that anyway. But there was absolutely nothing like the reactiveness that there is now. And I don't know that I would have the courage to do it now. Well, except that I'm old and I have the courage to do a lot of things I didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> But also, but also, I mean, you say that, you know, sort of like, well, it was before the current wave. And yet you you clearly like, for instance, in the Freedom Maze, you know, like just the roster of people that you had, you know, uh, Tempest and Nora and so on, like the, that you that you did precisely what one is meant to do. You know what I mean? And essentially the, that you did your writing the other homework is what I'm saying. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, but it's I, didn't, uh, I didn't do it so I wouldn't get into trouble. I did oh, it sure. because 
um, because That's the right I thing knew, to do. because because I had heard them talking about it, and I mm-hmm. had heard what yeah. damage it does if you don't do it. Yeah, and um, and they were kind enough to sit me down in a in in a um, oh we 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 decided we shouldn't do it in anybody is in, in anybody's living room in case in in case we got heated. So we. <laughs> We we went to a coffee shop uh, in, uh, in, in, in the village. It was it was, it was a tea shop in the mm-hmm. village, yeah. and I got highly caffeinated and, uh-huh. <laughs> and drank lots and pots of tea and sat around on sofas in the basement of this place. Mm. I think all afternoon, and people would kind of creep down there with their and then leave really fast. <laughs> it's not because we got heated; it was because there was like this like bubble of intensity. In the yeah, corner. yeah. Sure. Well, I think there's a you know there's the writer mind in terms of like wanting to do right by the story and um, getting the feedback and and I think having a circle of trust with the with the people who are helping you with that right when you're doing this kind of cultural consulting and um, checking yourself and then I think the the public reaction that may or may not come is I think we need to kind of learn how to how to keep those very separate right um, you you know I I wrote a story with a trans character. It was published at Asimov's, even though I had tried very hard to do the work of have, asking trans friends to to look at it and let me know. There was always the possibility they, you know, didn't see something that somebody else might find very hurtful. And so I braced, right? I, I braced for possible, you know, pushback. It didn't happen. You know, you say you didn't have the courage. I, I think you you have a lot of courage, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. I think, I, or, or that you wouldn't have the courage now. I think you would. I think if if such a if an idea or whatever came to you where you felt like there might be a big, you know, you know, uh, worldwide attack or whatever, I think what you would do is be sure that you were confident in the story and that you that it was, you know solid from as solid as you could make it and then you would put it out there and see what happened I, and also I, and also and then you listen like yeah. worldwide attack like i mean an attack yeah. i mean like i don't know like i mean of course it's possible that you might hit a nerve and people send mm-hmm. you death threats but more likely in the kinds of things you're talking about people are just going to tell you that they're upset about it yeah. and then if you're listening and you're like oh well, in that case, I screwed up. Like, right. you know what I mean? I feel yeah, like I won't, I won't do that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, right. thanks. Yeah. I don't know. Generally, the, the response to you just so, but Ben, and you're very, terrible thing. You is. are very chill about this. I, I do think most people have a harder time with that. I mean, that's that's an admirable, like, <laughs> I would love to get to that point where I could be that, like, you know, accepting of criticism but I mean like you know I, do, I don't like people being mad at me <laughs> yeah, yeah me too I have a really I have a very tough time with it and uh and so I, I really do have to a believe in the project strongly um yeah. and 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 yeah. be very braced for when it when it comes out because and I know writers you and I both know writers who have had big public critique who yeah. have um who have you know stopped writing for years as a result yes. right so sure. um sure. so there there's no oh, i yes i well, mean and i you know i i well yeah I'd, I'd like to, to say finish before answering now. this question just briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I wrote four middle grade novels and oh, yeah. enjoyed every minute of every one of them. But I had mm. had um, the ideas for three distinctly, two, three distinctly adult novels and one possible YA novel, although I, I think that it's an adult novel, but it's got a young protagonist. And mm-hmm. and the thing that makes it a little weird is that she does get married in the course of the book. And part of it is about her relationship with her husband. And that is mm-hmm. supposed to be like, you know, YA poison. I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm going to write <laughs> Um, you know, it's it, it's got a clockwork Sherlock Holmes in it. Hmm. How bad can it be? Hmm. Um, yeah. hey. <laughs> but I simply I don't have any more YA. I, I don't have any more middle grade ideas. I had, 
you know, I, I didn't start out with, I just kept, I'm, I'm going to follow this vein until I come to the end of the ore and I have mm -hmm. come to the end of the ore. And I have this other really rich vein of French history and, um, and, and Victorian stuff that I'm interested in and one New York story, which is, de which, and, and none of them is particularly fantastic. They're, mm -hmm. they're pretty much straight headed historicals. Oh, interesting. Um, but it's and that's just that I just I got to follow what yeah. I I can do. You you have a very very you're lucky in your agent that your agent is not giving you a very hard time about this. So well, you know, frankly, being being not mid career because mm. you know any Domini, um, it is actually very freeing mm. because you know that you've got to write what you want to write before you can't write anymore, yeah. and, so, mm -hmm. and and you might as well if you're going to be doing that. It's not like I'm going to grow my career. Right. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> reasonable about this um i i just want to I, I just want people to to to, to create these things mm -hmm. and whatever happens to them happens to them um and and this attitude i'm afraid does not serve me particularly well as a as a as as an author mm -hmm. it, it serves me beautifully as a writer mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that's but, a, that's <laughs> Go ahead. But, Sorry, I didn't want to but, cut you off. But I'm not. I, but if if I were more interested in being an author, I would have been one. Yeah. Um, I I can't. There there are certain things that I find that I'm not good at doing. I don't have the temperament for, and I don't have the, I don't have the ideas or the drive to do them. It's it's not work that I am really willing to put in. So, mm -hmm. I there i i am no good at self promotion i'm no good at the keeping up on 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 um social media i don't know how to set up the things that you have to set up in order to become somebody who's really out there and mm -hmm. and well known to a wide audience so you know that's fine um well, I, a, I, tough... I genuinely don't mind and and i love what i'm doing and i just want to keep doing it as long yeah. as i'm allowed well, I want to read all, selfishly, I want to read all of the books. While we were on the podcast, I went and bought the couple that I had somehow missed. Um, so, Marianne uh, is nothing if not a multitasker. They're, they're, no, like they're sitting in my, my Kindle right now. So I'm like, <laughs> I suppose we should finish recording, but I really want to go read these three Delia books that I, I somehow missed. Um, so we're going <laughs> to... We're going to wrap this section. Uh, we're, Delia will be back. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back with her partner, Ellen Kushner, her wife, Ellen Kushner. So um, so thank you so much, Delia. And uh, sit right here, and I'm going to go have lunch. OK, great. <laughs> so <laughs> more, more Good. soon. Bon appetit. So we are here with Ellen Kushner, um, author of many things. Um, uh, I was just learning, looking at her Wikipedia page, that she wrote Choose Your Own Adventure books, which I hadn't known. I first encountered her work with the Riverside's <laughs> first novel, Swords Point, which I read. It was published in 87. I read it. Um, that would have been in high school. Um, and I loved it. It was actually super formative to me as a baby queer. So, um, so I, we definitely want to talk about that. Um, the various Riverside things that followed, The Fall of the Kings with Delia, Privilege of the Sword, Man with the Knives, and uh, Tremontaine, which I was lucky enough to co-write one season of. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about all of that. Ellen has also written Thomas the Rhymer, which won the World Fantasy Award and the Mythopoeic Award, um, and St. Nicholas in the Valley Beyond the World's Edge, and has edited various books, including Welcome to Border Town, which is another shared world. Um, so, so maybe there'll be some overlap there. And she hosts a radio show. Um, uh, I did did host a radio show sound and spirit am i remembering that right mm -hmm. yes um so. i created a national series for public radio which yes. I really was the host of and was basically the equivalent of having written three novels <laughs> <laughs> yeah so a major that part was, of her life that was not a needle drop show yeah uh, <laughs> just and then and then there's a whole host of other things so um what can we pack into 45 minutes? I, I'd like to start with Swords Point, I think, um, which 
I'm, I'm sure you're used to people coming up to you and Googling about Swords Point. Um, maybe Not you could really just- often enough. Really? Well, they should. Um, yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the genesis of that book. And it looks like you, you started with the Trezor Adventures and then transitioned to writing in your own world. So a little bit about that would be fascinating. I'm going to explain something to you. And okay. To you. Novels take a long time to write, at least. <laughs> <laughs> really? I, I did not know that. <laughs> I've never written a novel before, and you thought it would be easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> so during that time, you must eat and pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> during that time, I heard about this new thing. It was the World Fantasy Con in... Um, uh, in New Haven. It was the one time it was in New Haven, I believe. And I heard, I met this guy who was the editor from Bantam and he was talking about this new project. And I thought, hmm, easy money. So I signed up to write some, all based on the childhood adventures that I wished I had had beginning mm -hmm. with childhood. I actually wanted to do a Little Women one. It would have been so much fun. Oh, wow. Yeah, but that they said, no, it has to be, you know, unisex. So I did uh, a one and a King Arthur huh. one, all this stuff. So they basically paid pretty well for back then. Mm -hmm. And I just kept writing them so that I could continue to pay the rent. And they actually taught me also a lot about plotting. Mm -hmm. Not nearly enough, as it turned out, but but I could <laughs> good, good schools for, for plotting. So I wrote, I, I contracted and wrote five. And the last one came out. And of course, I'm always late on everything. So the last one came out about the same time as Swords Point. Um, and I wrote it incredibly quickly while I was moving to Boston to work for WGBH Radio. So that one I still feel is <clears throat> not my best. But, <laughs> you know, and it's so funny. And I used to tour with the Choose Your Owns. Um, really? Then, yeah, because I was like in my 20s. I didn't have anything better to uh -huh. do. I didn't have a day job. I was working on Swords Point and Thomas the Rhymer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And... Uh, I love being up in front of people, as you know. Mm. And so they'd send me to these schools and I'd be going to these really, you know, small schools in small towns and they would make this huge fuss over me being an author and everybody would do <laughs> that. And on the one hand, I wore like my cool New York 80s boots, like the blue suede with the studs. <laughs> I'm a cool person and I write books. You should read books, kids. But part of me wanted to take them aside and go, kids, you know, these aren't really books. <laughs> they're, games. they're games in story form yeah. but yeah. Yeah, yeah. books like have beginnings and middles and ends and you read yeah. them but I never did I was very good <laughs> well, I want to I want to pause you for a second because it's it's interesting when you talk about the the learning plot structure from theirs. So I wrote two. Um, they're not technically choose your own adventure books because that's copyrighted and we weren't allowed to use that. Yeah. Uh, framing so it was create your own erotic fantasy these were Peng penguin did adult versions of these and so really? um yeah. i wrote two of them for penguin um, there's always a lot of plot in porn yeah okay good. yeah and so well you know but i, I think the porn is known for its conflict. it was it was it was uh, a it was very useful to me uh writing these to think through like because it's basically a branching tree structure right so for anyone listening who is a writer interested in learning how to plot better um i think what i found most fascinating was you know you could you could give the author these the sorry you could give the reader these options based on you know do you open this door or that door but what was interesting is if you gave it enough character weight that what they chose was then revelatory of character right so that even though they all started as the same character at the start mm. of the novel, by the end of the book, if you follow all the branches, you you end up with like 24 different people at the end, right? Because they they who would make those choices determines what ending they get, right? And I, I just think, so I think it's useful in terms of structure and plot, but also in terms of character development. And Ben is actually currently writing a game version of this. Um, what's the name yeah, of it? Yeah, there's a computer there's a computer game app like choice of choice of games that's it's and it's a similar concept, but unlike the um, choose your adventure books, which are on paper, so you don't have any state. If you go there, then that's it. You went there. You're not mm -hmm. coming back. You could loop, but then that's sort of, you know, a cutesy thing. Um, but these, of course, are actually building a model of your character. So this is a Jewish historical fantasy. Mm. And, you know, so you and when you when you write the pitch for them, you sort of say, what are the stats you're going to use? And that's kind of like, in a way, that's sort of very genre defining. So the, my, you know, the, the character was like uh, learned, daring, deep, 
um, like you get a rating on, you know, and, and depending on your choices, you sort of figure out, are you the daring, you know, do you throw the apple at the back of the dairy man's head after he splashes your, you know, clothes with mud? Or do you like reflect on, you know, the irrelevance of all this? And you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, you know, the, the or do you ham it up for the crowd? Like charming. And anyway, so, so you can, you know, and then, you know, in the end, there's a bunch of branching choices, but instead of, instead of just branching like this, it always sort of comes back together, but you are building the idea of the character as you go. So it's a little more of a beginning, middle, middle and end than a, yeah. than a, well, than it's a pure choose your adventure book. But still, it has own, that, like, who is the character? Who is the protagonist? We find out as we go. When the Choose Your Owns began, it was like a proto, um, you know, computer game, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It had to be done with paper. And yeah. I just always, like, colored paper clips and charts and colored pens. And, uh -huh. Oh, it's pathetic. But I got to tell you that <laughs> what you guys are describing is, is pretty far from what the children's Choose Your Own. Well, I, I read the children's <laughs> ones, yes. <laughs> sure, I read them too. Yeah. Like, like, I wanted to... Yeah have moral choices and shit like that and i was told oh, uh, no, no. one third death one third evil, <laughs> and one third success so <laughs> you fall in a pit yeah 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 so uh no, I, I remember I will, I will them yeah, you, they, yeah. but what's it's, so crazy to me now is you know that well, i remember being that person i remember meeting those kids and everybody's grown up now years mm -hmm. kids along much to my shock and yeah. now and that when i first started meeting like relative adults like in their 20s mm -hmm. saying, oh, God, i read those when i was a kid that was a big moment for me and now <laughs> it's like <laughs> people read them when they were a kid and and i accept yeah. it and i'm glad that i gave them some joy so yeah. swords <laughs> swords point onto swords point which i read in high school sorry um I know, but, i'm used to it i mean honestly yeah. again the first couple of times people said oh my god i loved that book when i was a kid or when i was a teenager yeah. i read that in high school my first thought was you what because it was the <laughs> yes. and daring for for a young person <laughs> in ways yeah. it isn't now um but secondly you know there's that i could talk a lot about what it's like to go through these transitions of being the the bright not merely the bright mm. young thing, but the daring young thing. Mm -hmm. And getting to the point where, you know, people read you in high school and all these, it's been just so interesting being in the field this long. A lot of people come mm. in and out of it. Uh, a lot of people start at different times and, you know, then wander off and become lawyers or whatever. But um, I've had the very good fortune to be, to have been able to stick around long enough to watch things change and to watch people's attitude toward me change and to have to absorb mm. it, to have to mm -hmm. absorb it. You know, so it's my, it was daring for the time. I, I almost feel like it's still daring now, right? So for people who haven't read it, Swords Point is um, a romance sword adventure set in Riverside. Um, and it's uh, kind a of- made A made up Riverside. A made up Riverside. And, and the, the protagonists are, are Richard St. Vere and um, Alec. Um, and it's a, so a, a gay romance but I think what, what was most striking to me when I read it at the time was how real they seemed in terms of the um, messed upness of their characters, Alec in particular, and the relationship. And it was very not conventional in terms of what, you know, what I had read of romance in general. Um, and... I, I was very deeply invested in in their love affair, and um, I don't I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I I don't I still don't feel like I see so much of that, and um, just in the the writing world overall, not as much as I would like. Um, so no, okay, uh, and, and in the Strongly, I feel strongly. So, so the one of the many reasons I love Ben is because he and I crashed <laughs> a Hugo Losers Party in Glasgow. In Glasgow, uh -huh. and basically spent the entire party having him tell me my books back to me. <laughs> <laughs> just read and I remember that. Someone, yes. Yeah, with Ben's brilliant brilliance and. <laughs> Tell you what he read was one of the high points of my life. I remember almost none of it, but I remember the, the exhilaration <laughs> and the joy. I feel sure Ben would like to say that they are not, in fact, romances. <laughs> well, I don't know if I mean I I, I, I don't know I, I don't know I I, 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 I 
it's got a romance in it, but it's not a romance. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. so well, I, I'm not yeah, an expert so, on romance. Yeah, I don't. So I don't know what what defines a romance. Their relationship right? is certainly pretty central. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's maybe it's an anti romance. I don't know. It's 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 um, but certainly their relationship is very much the crux of it. And I I, I resonate with what Mar- Marianne is saying about the 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 messiness of it and the and the like it doesn't have that it doesn't have the um, formulaic romance sense that you're sort of rushing toward a tidy conclusion you know what mm-hmm. I mean um, and on the contrary it sort of expands outward and mm-hmm. you're dwelling in the in the sort of um, uh, intimacy and chaos and and uh, you know and connection but also disconnection like it's a very you know honest and real um, anyway. Uh, well, yeah. I'm also thinking, I mean, there's more to the book than that, but, yes. but yes, sure, sure. Is, is at the core of it. Basically, I gotta yeah. say, I wrote it as a novel, um, not as a genre piece, knowing mm-hmm. that I was breaking all the rules. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's a fantasy without magic. It's, yeah. it's a queer relationship at the heart of it. And also there's no good guys. Like mm-hmm. everybody in it is fairly bad. And <laughs> I remember Steve Bruce coming up to me. Steve Bruce is is a great romantic, you know? Mm-hmm. And all of his books are basically, you know, sort of based on Juma and stuff like that. And he's a man with a lot of ethics. And uh, right after the book came up, came out, he said, came up to me and said, I, I gotta tell you, I really was very uncomfortable with this book. And I, and I mm-hmm. examined myself deeply and thought, am I homophobic? And you know, no, I really don't think I am. It's that everybody in it was so immoral. <laughs> 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 yes, that's a very good reason not to like the book. Good work, Steve. <laughs> I almost feel like Richard St. Vere is, is almost amoral rather than immoral. Do you know what I mean? Like he's, you know, he's he's committed to the sword and the discipline of the sword and he loves Alec and that's kind of all there is for him. I mean, you know, and like that's that's sort of prim- whereas Alec is maybe a little more on the immoral side, right? Uh in that he can be spiteful and vengeful and etc and so on, right? So but I don't know. I'm sorry. It was it was perfect for a teenager to read because everything is so my daughter is 14 and uh is starting to read romances. She just read um uh, she's reading Red White and Royal Blue right now, which is a a new delightful romance about uh, the love affair between the son of the first American woman president who in the in the novel was elected when Hillary Clinton would have been elected um, and the heir to the royal throne. Um, so two men. I don't want to lose the thread here. So I'm going yeah, to- yeah, No, no, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to take you down over the word romance, but I think to me, well, but let me, let me the just romance write. is really central. Frankly, their, their romance has an incredible amount of charisma. Yeah. And they, as characters, have a lot of charisma. And I, I mean, mm-hmm. I've met right. so many readers who go, they're horrible people, but I really love them. Yeah. yeah. And I, that's charisma. A friend of mine, Caroline Stevemer, who was the person I met on my first day in college and mm. both went on to be writers. And she, while I was writing it, you know, we talked on the phone a lot. And she said, they're sunlit villains. Mm. But their relationship is at the heart of a novel where a whole lot of other stuff is going on. And the society mm-hmm. is... Mm-hmm kind of based on um in in many ways based on my coming into young adulthood in new york in the 80s a pretty racy place but also i was a pretty sheltered person and i suddenly Mm -hmm. started to understand how power worked Mm. yeah my very first job out of college was my first um, permanent job was I, I lucked into an extraordinary job which was being the assistant to the new science fiction and fantasy editor at ace books Mm-hmm. And that was Jim Bain, and he, he wasn't that interested in fantasy. So I became the fantasy editor, you know, at the age of 22. Mm-hmm. And, but was told, Jim knew me though. I was this wild person, you know, barely tamed. Uh, I don't come <laughs> from a background where anybody in my family is in business. So mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm in, from a fairly non hierarchical um, culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Bain took me aside and pointed out Tom Doherty to me, who was at the time, I guess, the, the manager for, or the head of ACE, and said, you're not allowed to talk to him. Mm. <laughs> so how fucked up is that? Because part of the, like, young Ellen is going, what do you mean I'm allowed to talk to him? He's a human being. I can talk to him if I want to. Uh-huh. But it was sure. clear that Bain was terrified that if I talked to Doherty, you know, I would say <laughs> incredibly wrong things and get him in yeah. trouble. Mm. And he was probably yeah. right. But yeah. I remember that moment kind of going, oh, so that's how it works out here in the real world. Mm-hmm. 
So in some ways, Swords Point was my, I mean, it engaged with two things that mattered a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One was the fear of violence mm -hmm. in a New York where you really could just get, you know, mugged on the street, yeah. particularly in my neighborhood. Uh, uh -huh. The Upper West Side, which is hilarious because now it's a very, you know, family oriented, safe, expensive neighborhood. But when I lived on 110th Street, you know, mm -hmm. you carried your keys, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. your fingers so that you could hit anybody who, who yeah. mm -hmm. after you. Fortunately, I was never I was never attacked, but you knew you could be at any time. And mm -hmm. you know, and our apartment got broken into, everybody's cars got broken into. Not that we had a car, but you could hear it. And so I was kind of dealing with what's it like to live in a place that violent? Wouldn't it be nice yeah. if you had somebody who was always always had your yeah. back? Yeah. Uh, well, but I think that so you have this uh, fear of violence, you have these questions of power, and I don't want to lose what I was trying to get to with the teen thing was the emotional mm -hmm. intensity, right? Because yeah. there's a way in which that relationship, whether you call it a romance or not, has this incredible emotional intensity that was very resonant for teens and young adults, I think. Um, and I, it's interesting because by the time you and I were writing on Tremontine together, you were mostly writing Diane's character, um, who I, I feel like your concerns had shifted more towards these questions of power. Um, does that seem fair as a... But I think Search was... Point is a book you can read through uh, in either mm -hmm. filter. I can see that as a, as if you're a baby queer teen picking up that book, Alex and Richard are going to completely loom large. But the right. book is also a novel of intrigue, right? It's also right. a novel of like, what uh, what runs this city? And I, I mean, uh, as you say that, I definitely see that that is another, like the machinations and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the operations of of power. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I love talking about Richard and Alec and about their romance. I'm happy to talk and talk and talk about that. I just wanted people who uh, don't know the book to know that there's a mm -hmm. lot more going on in it, which is, I think, why it's endured. Because mm -hmm. if you yeah. read it for, you know, for the slashy Richard and Alec stuff, it's certainly there, but there's a lot <laughs> of other stuff that people read it for and they get the uh, the hot Richard and Alec sex. So, um, and there's a lot so of, actually, there's yeah. also the world building is subtle. As you say, it's not like an overt fantasy with magic and everything, but there's a lot like going on in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the kind of a world that it is and the and the way that that mirrors, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, then can I ask, I, I, I jumped ahead a little too much to Tremontaine, I think, because I, I want to hit um, Fall of the Kings and Privilege of the Sword. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about the yeah. transition to collaborating with Delia on Fall of the Kings after yeah. writing on your own, primarily, sure. I guess. Yeah. And, and just so that I don't forget what we said about Tremontaine, the reason we were focused on that was because we had to decide on a plot and that was it. Um, and my fellow writers, it was a collaborative uh, sequel, mm -hmm. collaborative prequel to Swords Point. You know, we basically decided that's what it was going to be about. Um, but I've written a lot of short stories uh, that sort of fill in the gaps between the novels. So what I follow personally is very much the personalities of the characters. Mm -hmm. And what I, I've written about Richard before Alec, I've written about him after Alec, I've written about Alec as an older man. And uh, it just, as I change and as my view of the world changes, I bring that with me to the city. Riverside is just one section of the city, but since the city has no name, it's it's convenient to refer to the whole thing as Riverside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, so so here's what happened. It was pretty funny. After Swords, when Swords Point came out, I was like, I'm not going to write, uh, you know, sequels. That's trashy, which it was <laughs> in 1987. Um, you know, I'm not Marion Zimmer Bradley. I'm going to write another book. Uh, so I wrote Thomas the Rhymer, uh, which is based on uh, balladry and folklore, which is another of my passions. But I missed my guys. <laughs> I really did. I missed my guys and I missed the city and I had moved to Boston to work in radio, very different life from what I was, had been living in New York and went back to New York and said, oh, the city's changing. Mm. I, I bet my city's changing too. Mm. So there was that kind of thread pulling me. Mm. Mm -hmm. I can keep with this. And my challenge to myself when I went back and wrote more about them was always, you have to take a different angle, use a different viewpoint, use a different way of writing about it so that it didn't all look like Swords Point 2, Swords Point 3, Swords Point 4. Mm -hmm. I know like now I would do that automatically because that's what people do for writing and for careers, everything should have uh, sequels, but I was not going to be that person. So <laughs> at the time it wasn't expected of one. 
So mm -hmm. I said, okay, you can write about them, but only if you come at it very differently every time. So the mm -hmm. next book that I thought of, which I actually thought of pretty shortly after Swords Point was published, was it's for a feminist, it doesn't have a lot of girls in it, does it? So I felt <laughs> guilty about that. So I'm like, all right, well, what would a girl think of all of this? Where would she stand in all of this? And Alex's teenage niece came into mm -hmm. my mind, teenage girl, looking at Richard and Alec would have a very different response if, <laughs> if they were your relatives and not characters in a book. Um, and I began that novel, which became The Privilege of the Sword, sent it to my agent at the time, and she did not lavish me with praise, and so I put it in a drawer. <laughs> so that really was always meant to be the second book. And even though mm. it was published as the third, it is in fact the second book to the narrative. Uh, it takes place 15 years after Swords Point. So she's more or less being born while Alec and Richard are up to their shenanigans. And then she turns up 15 years later and you see them and through her eyes and she has her own adventures. But first of all, I had this big career in radio at WGBH and I thought, wow, this is great. I'll be a national public radio star and then everyone will buy my books. And my books started going out of print. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, dear, this will never do. And by then I had fallen in love with the beautiful Delia Sherman and Delia had been a big Swords Point fan. And so when we hung out together, we would make up stories about the characters and about, but, but not about my characters because you don't touch my characters. We did kind of the next generation and made up um, Basil and Theron. Um, Basil, who are the heroes or anti-heroes again of um, the fall of the Kings. We wrote a short, and at one point we just looked at each other and said, you know, we're both writers. If we wrote this down, people would give us money. So, <laughs> seriously, literally said that. So we wrote a, a novella for um, Nicola Griffith and Steve, I'm blanking his last name. They did the first anthologies of- The Bending the Landscape uh, anthologies. Steve yeah. Cagle, Cagle. yeah. yeah. Um, and so we wrote and, and sent it to them and they liked it. But we had, had to, we had so much more material and we'd had to cut so much more material out of that um, quote, short story to get it down to 10,000 words that I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working all the time in radio, but we could turn this into a novel if we just put back in the 10,000 words we cut and added another, you know, 20, 30,000, um, uh, know. You know, it would be a novel. <laughs> Well, Delia is not really capable of that. So we added about <laughs> 20,000 characters and 20,000 plot lines and three years later, <laughs> it came out. but it, but it re kickstarted, you know, we started and got back into print. Um, the, the first novel got Swords Point and Thomas back mm -hmm. in print with uh, yeah. Bantam, what was then Bantam, I guess now Random House. And my agent who I had, my previous agent had retired. She was fabulous. And I, I just shouldn't have been so scared of her. But mm. uh, my new agent, Christopher Schelling, said, now is the time. I know you've got another Swords Point novel in your drawer. Take it out, mm. look up the proposal, and we'll sell it. And that's what mm. happened. Mm -hmm. That's mm. interesting. Was yeah. it challenging writing with your wife? It was the best thing that could possibly have happened to us. And Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're... And people are always saying, oh, what's it like to write with your best friend or your partner? Should I do it? Or, oh, I could never do it. We are very well suited to it. Mm. We're just well suited to it. Um, we, we did it all through talking and was kind of like mm -hmm. girls playing Barbies. Like, okay, okay, let's say, <laughs> oh my God, yeah, and then I would do this. Okay, okay, but what, uh -huh. it captured, you know? It was really, <laughs> literally, that was how we wrote the first draft of the book. And then mm -hmm. I was working um, full-time and more on, on my show, my new show and getting that launched. Um, and she was between novels and kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, it was really a big gift of hers to me to spend mm -hmm. a couple of years that she did on this book. Mm -hmm. but. It was not long after we had started living together mm -hmm. and we learned, we realized in retrospect that we learned an enormous amount about how to negotiate personal stuff mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. negotiating stuff with the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We learned you know, kind of a language and a technique and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And basically all mm -hmm. we ever talked about was the novel for like two years. It's, it's like being completely obsessed with something. Wow. <laughs> And once the novel was done, we're like, oh, what do we talk about now? Well, I guess we have to fix all the problems. <laughs> you, know what, you know how it is with couples. So, um, yeah. so I mean, I can go into detail. I've done, I've done interviews about this a bunch. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I, I was asking. It was, asking about, it was hella fun. It was, a, mm. I'm, I was curious in part because Jed and I once tried to write a short story together and mm. we don't normally fight and 
like <laughs> three scenes in we had a huge fight like we were just like and mm. we, we just we ended up walking away from the project because we were like mm. okay this is going to kill our relationship and then in fact a couple days ago my one of my best friends and I we'd been talking about trying to do a a screenplay together so we we she came over and we sat on the porch and um started talking it out and it got tense a couple times you know and I think it's a it's a uh it's being strong-willed having very strong ideas in your own head and learning to be flexible about that and I think that was a, a challenge for me with writing for wild cards a challenge writing Tremontaine um Tremontaine was in some ways easier because it was so clearly, well, this is Ellen's world and I can just, it makes sense that I keep deferring to her, right? So having, whereas Wild Cards is, is more, you know, like it started as a group of people and so it's continued to have that kind of ethos rather than being any one person's world. Um, I don't know. And Ben, you've done some collaborative writing. I don't know whether this has been an issue. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm just too stubborn or what. Like it's, it is, it is, it's a process for I, me I to, get like rid of, to get rid of the ego a little, you know. I, I usually, I often have what Ellen is describing at the beginning where I'm like, ooh, and then this, ooh, and then that, you know, like that, that exciting, um, uh, you know, the excitement of doing it together and like, you know, because the project wouldn't spark unless there was something that, I mean, I, cause I'm not, this is different than a formal thing like wild cards, I suppose, where you're sort of invited to participate in a thing that's already ongoing, but all the collaborations I've done have been just like, Hey, what if we did this? And that has then like its own momentum. I often find that sort of midway at some point I do get like, like halfway through, I'm like, all right, all right. I just want to do it. Let me get, get it, get away. <laughs> <laughs> like sort of like, it's sort of like, you know, when it starts bogging down or whatever, there's there's a certain temptation to be just like, ah, I could just get it done if I could just, you know, not have to talk to you, you know, like that's, so there's that phase, but, but I don't know, that's, but usually, you know, then it goes through different, I've also had things that sort of subsided for a while and then you pick it back up again. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I love to collaborate. That, I love to collaborate, you, yeah. but actually one thing that, that I think we tend to miss in, in either idealizing it or or not is you do sort of have uh, I, my my therapist when I was trying to figure out how the hell to work with the people on my radio show which was really fraught she said she she did a lot of like you know presentations to businesses and she said yeah basically you have to say who who has um, input and who has final say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so with Trim and Ten I had final say everybody had mm -hmm. input. And, and I think the problem with collaborating with somebody is you're not going to agree on everything. So you can either mm -hmm. argue it to the death or yeah. just give somebody for some reason gets to be the final say person. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was kind of cool for Delia and me. We each sort of owned a set of characters and a play. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I owned, you know, the nobles and the hill and therefore the main character of Theron and mm -hmm. Delia owned Basil and the university. And mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so she always had final say on Basil and the characters around him. And mm -hmm. I always had final say on the others. And we wrote each other's characters and everything. But the other one was allowed to say, you know, mm, no, that that's not right, that he wouldn't do that or yeah. whatever. Whereas yeah. but for the world itself, I had the final say. And I think the same was true for Tremont 10. You know, you, you guys had final say on, on the characters you'd invented. Mm -hmm. And I had final say on the world. That's, uh, yeah, that's and right. Actually, if you walk into one of these situations knowing who has final say on everything, it can prevent a lot of, of stresses. Yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I think what, what was coming up with my friend the other day was we were trying to decide, I had sort of assumed we were going to be writing this in this world that I've already developed, and mm -hmm. in which case I would have ownership and final say mm -hmm. on like these bigger structural things. And mm -hmm. she had not been making that assumption and was thinking we were going to build a new thing collaboratively, yeah. which, you know, and then it would be shared ownership. And um, so that that created some some tensions. <laughs> so I was oh, like, I, you're, she kept trying to do things. And I was like, but that's going to break the world. Yeah, and she's like, yeah. let's do a different world. I'm like, how many worlds can I hold in my head? I'm not sure. So <laughs> <laughs> and there are things that just aren't going to work. But I also had a lot of experience doing um Border Town with Terry Windling, and mm -hmm. she had created that world. And so she right. always had final say. Uh, yeah. And that made it easy for everybody in a way, but it also was a huge amount of work for her because as stuff came in, she would have to mm. filter it. So, but yeah. anyway, when I when I did the thing with Delia, I, I did a lot of interviews. We did a lot of interviews together about, you know, what's it like to collaborate? And I realized half my work is collaboration. I love mm. collaboration. 
Mm-hmm. But the other part of it is you need to be able to make a good argument without getting emotional. And I learned mm-hmm. that doing my radio show because, oh God, this absolutely brilliant, beautiful show with a staff that was too small and a producer who came in uh, full of charm and realized that he hated me because I was the forces of chaos to the point where we mm. couldn't work together. And mm. the executive producer who was my boss and had created the show with me became the guy who listened to all my scripts and you know we revised them together. Mm. And he wasn't a lawyer, but his father had been a lawyer. And we basically had these lawyerly arguments about why a line or a piece that I mm. had was right. And I just realized if I could out-argue him, I could get mm. my way, if I could just- yeah. And I was kind of brought up in a family that was like that too. Like when we were mm. little kids, basically if we could out argue our parents, what were they going to do? So, <laughs> so I also have some experience with that. <laughs> I came yeah, home yeah. from college once and was arguing with my mother and she got super frustrated. And she said, it's not that you're right. You've just gotten better at arguing. <laughs> and, I, and, and I was like, mm. <laughs> Great skill to have. My yeah, kids got is. very oh, well. good at arguing very young because it <laughs> I, I generally well because I, uh, I you know I, I vowed off saying because I said so very early in the in the process so I I therefore was you know it, therefore their their growing up was sounds like it was a lot like yours like if they could argue they could make the case then you know so I have a, I have a question kind of for both of you I I what you're talking about to some extent sounds like part of Jewish culture as well this right that's sure. fair and um, yeah. I'm curious whether you see Ellen's Riverside novels as Jewish inflected. Does that make sense to you as a question? It's a great question and, mm-hmm. and one I've been dying for someone to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and someone finally has. So I, that's the question. Oh. I'll, either one of you can yeah. dive in on Go. that. No, I want to hear what Ellen has to say. <laughs> oh, really? I want to hear what you will. <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious, Ben, if you have an answer, but you probably haven't read the book. The setting is European, right? The setting is is this, um, you know, and I, I think our kind of default European nobility setting is Christian, right? Like, we, oh, yeah. so um, so I, I, I guess I'm wondering how that gets inflected. To be really these... specific, the world is, the world and the society are a mishmash of all my faves. So there's mm. a lot of Georgette higher Regency, which is really Edwardian. There's a lot of um, Dorothy Dunnett 16th century stuff fused with Shakespeare 16th century stuff. A little bit of Jane Austen. Uh, you know, I, I don't do the 19th century. <laughs> it holds no appeal for me. Uh, and I do have to say that when I wrote the book, almost nobody was working in those periods. Everything was still medieval, but mm. uh, everything was still rural, you know? Mm. So, so doing urban and... Um, yeah. 18th century was like a pretty big deal so yes that is all there and so that's the jewish wish fulfillment part of like oh i want to be those mm. people <laughs> mm. ah. i'll tell you one thing that's hilarious to me uh, so i grew up keeping kosher and i don't really do it now but there are a few things i don't eat and one of them is pork no one in the books i just realized <laughs> never yeah eats pork because it a, it doesn't occur to me, and B, ew, gross. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating. I, you know, I'm thinking Fall of Kings has a, a sort of religious, yeah. you know, element to it, but it's you know pagan. Well, we worked up the religion. We kind of worked up the religions. I kept them very much in the background in the other two books, yeah. uh, but we worked them up for Fall of the Kings for various reasons. And it's you know kind of your basic. It, it's kind of like Greco-Roman, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm. I tried to do a Greco-Roman religion and whenever I need religion in any of the things I'm working on with it, I'll throw some of that in. Um, I do so- sort of wish I had just read them so I could have a deeper answer to the question, but I do <laughs> feel like there's something about the, uh, the uh, you know, it's not, there's not, it's not like overtly Jewish like some of your other, like some other things that you've done. Um, well, like one thing you did for me, and also the Wait, which, <laughs> which thing? Dreidel. Okay. Uh, she actually wrote a piece for for uh, Dream Apart, like a, a, a an ex- extra content for the, oh, the for the fantasy role playing game. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, but uh, but I think that as you say, there's some this this kind of it's sort of like it's sort of maybe like uh, you know the way superhero comics. I don't know. Like, there's a certain urban, rootless, restless 
um, uh, aspirational, being uh, attracted to the 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 sort of centers of power, but not really of them, you mm-hmm. know, or 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 you know, and also sort of demimond, you know, like the kind of uh, racy part of town where all the weirdos are, like that. That just it, you know, it's definitely there's a lot Jewish adjacent <laughs> about that sensibility, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, the, I... the, the... go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. The thing that I realized about it, it took me a while, um, and Marianne, you'll like this, is the extent to which the characters' narratives, um, you know, Alec in particular, and then basically all the other novels are about people who are his relatives. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's very relational, uh, yeah. I, mean, I realize the more, the older I get, the more I realize how autobiographical it is. It's about family. Mm. It's about family mm-hmm. and tradition, and what do you owe them, and what does it take? Yeah, them? yeah, yeah. There's a, you know, there's a there's a thing that happens. I think part of why I'm curious about this is that there, there's sort of a classic thing that people of color, um, writers of color, do it, which is that we write white people first, right? Often for years without even realizing that we're making all of our characters white. So, like the first year I wrote, I wrote mm-hmm. like 20 stories. 19 of them had only white people in them right and I didn't notice for years um and so that's part of it is I I'm just wondering to what extent you felt like you you could write Jewish protagonists I mean we had there were writers like Lisa Goldstein was writing you know the red magician is brilliant if people have it on that I oh, quit you? my oh. job before the book came out and I'm really mad because if I'd been her <laughs> all the way through, it would have been really great. I mean, it is really great, but it yeah. would have been great for me and her. Yeah, I love that book to death. Go on, sorry. Yeah, yes, yes. I love the book. It won, won a big award. I can't quite, I can't remember which one. National but book award. And David National Hart book award, yeah. Back early from her first trip to Europe to accept the award. See, I was there for all this shit. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll have to do history of the field conversations with you um, and cover all of this in more detail, I think. But the, anyway, it, just, it makes me it makes me wonder write about it. Marianne, can I can I defend your point, your your case uh, and mine as well and Ursula Le Guin's as well. Mm-hmm. What we write when we write books initially tends to be our version of the books we've read. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the reason I feel that Le Guin's main characters were always men at the beginning was because books were about men. You know, mm-hmm. basically books were about men. So it made perfect sense. And for me too, as I was always trying to defend myself for having, you know, written Swords Point as a book about two guys. And, you know, there are lots of reasons why that's my kink, but it also, I thought, well, that's what, that's what the books you read are and that's the books you're gonna write. Mm-hmm. So I think for you and for me, books are about white people. You know, that's mm-hmm. what books are. It's gonna be so different for, you know, people growing up now, but man, mm-hmm. that, that's just that's what it was, and and then as you gain your powers, and um, and for us at least, the world has changed around us while we're gaining our powers. Do you feel able- like there was resistance to publishing Jewish stories and Jewish characters? Like if you had written them, know. no. Well, no. you know, it would have been a bit radical, and I'm still mad at myself because I my other passion, and I've never written them, but I love to read them, is like Edward Eager and e- mm. Enid, and I was going to do like a, an Edward Eagery kind of book with Jews in it, and I had it, mm. I had it all worked out, but I was too disorganized to write it, and now there are a lot of books like that, so, so I don't think, I don't think there was an objection, I just think it literally had not occurred to people. Yeah. I think I, it would have been welcome. I, I, I'll tell you, something that, that was, is interesting, so there, there of course, you know, Jews loom large in the, it's not quite like a lot of other uh, marginalized people's experience because of course Jews loom yeah. large in the in the history of establishment, you know, of, of establishing American literary and cinematic traditions and so on, right? Like comic books, Hollywood, Broadway, like, you know, and, and publishing to some extent, just, you know, was something that Jews gravitated to. I mean, we're in New York and LA. And uh, so it's not, but there was also this kind of internalized thing of like, you know, the, the maxim in Hollywood was like, write Jewish, cast British, you know, mm. or <laughs> like that, that's what they said. They, you know, like you, you, well, you write with lots of like arguing and whatever, but then you cast these very poised. I mean, if they are Jews, then they could pass, you know, like, I mean, mm. you know, you want, you want them to seem very smooth and, and, and British, right? And, and uh, on the screen. So there was, you know, it was like we were sort of consigned to the back room. So it's not so much that there's not, wasn't room, but there was also there's a kind of constrained like 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 how how you're supposed to show up. And there's something that I definitely noticed, which is that there was lots of room to be 
funny, for instance. There's lots of room to be sort of, you know, I, Dream Apart, writing Dream Apart, I was not, I do not think there were many Jewish role-playing games, right? Like lots of Jews grew up playing role-playing games. I, I did a literature search before putting it out there where I was like, is there, there's like a module for Vampire the Masquerade, just kind of Holocaust-y. There's like, uh, you know, I don't know, there was like a couple of joke things. There was hardly anything. And part of the psychological barrier to writing that was that like literally in my own mind, like if I can't Jewish role-playing games, it sounds like a Mel Brooks stick, right? It's going to be like Morris, the accountant goes into the dungeon. You know what I mean? Like that's what, and, and it, it's right. Like there's like, there's this very big space there to make it absurd and actually like taking it seriously as a sensibility being like, or to, to have it be, uh, you know, like a, like, like just sort of thinly Judaicized, but really like, Oh, it's a guy, you know, and I mean, but you know, but that, that, that quickly gets toward parody. There's a discomfort. Mm. I mean, Cohen, the barbarian, right? Like yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a, it, it, it's quickly becomes the send up and to be like, no, these are actually the people from, this is really going to be like a truly folkloric, like that, which is similar to with the golden dreidel, like, like a, and we're actually going to try to tap into the sources of what's powerful about Isaac, but a singer or whatever, and have that be this game. But that it was, a, there was a big, gap there where it didn't so it's not like anybody was going to object but it was like an internalized feeling of like well that's not me i'm not the guy with the you know well it's got to be a guy with a sword and i'm not the guy with a sword unless it's funny uh, you and know the, what i mean the other thing is that that the culture that we know of is you know it's a bunch of farmers who were oppressed uh, you know <laughs> it's not as attractive as some things are and it wasn't <laughs> not even farmers it's a bunch of people not permitted to farm it's a bunch of rag right, sellers yeah, yeah. who are you know right so and, well, I'm curious what you guys think of the Kindath. Do you know the Kindath and Guy Gabriel Kay's novels? The Kindath are the Jews, um, mm -hmm. and they are in his books. They are, you know, oppressed, etc. And there's one in particular who is a, a doctor, a Jewish doctor, um, mm -hmm. who is central to the novel. I think it's in the Lions of Alversan, and I think you would both enjoy it a lot. So it's mm -hmm. um, really interesting. I mean, there's a whole bit about how they're oppressed and how they're treated by the other religious groups who are dominant and what happens when this Jewish doctor like saves this Lord's life and whatever, right? Like it, it gets very complicated and interesting. Um, I think you'd like it. But anyway, cut all that. Go back, Ellen. Pick up no, where you, you're you can put it in. Just leave out when you go. Do you know Guy K? <laughs> <laughs> pick up the part you where just... you say, "Well, in Guy K's da da da." You know, really serious. That okay. Well, Darius, do your best with that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Ellen, you were going to show us a book and talk about something. So just yeah, big big book recommendation of a, a mm. book that is great Jewish fantasy. And the first one I read, it's by mm. Lillian Natel, N A T T E L, and it's called The River Midnight. And it literally gives me all the fantasy feels while taking place in a real, you know, historic style shtetl mm -hmm. in um, 19th century Europe. I will say yeah. more other, just trust me, just trust me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The River Midnight. It Got it. And it, you know, it did okay. But, but there, this book is the kind mm -hmm. of thing we wanted. And mm -hmm. it does exist. Um, mm -hmm. Lillian is a wonderful writer. I also think yeah. like Michael Shabon does really oh, yeah. interesting things with mm -hmm. sort of, um, I don't know, they feel very, I mean, yeah. very Jewish infused, but also, sure. you know, he doesn't talk about Judaism per se in. Well, he does a lot in Yiddish in, Policeman's Union and Yiddish Gentleman Policeman. of the Road, which are, yeah. well, you know, G G Gentleman of the Road, <laughs> literal working title Jews with swords. Oh, I haven't, so that, that one I haven't read yet. I, I've read his, um, I read Yiddish Policeman's Union, obviously, yes, very explicit. And I felt like that one was interesting to me because I, I had read a bunch of his other novels and I got to that one and I was like, I am missing at least half of what's going on in this book. Mm. Um, hmm. So that was that was a little disconcerting. Like I was but, like, this is, I'm not his primary know, audience here. <laughs> it's not a real, well, yeah, no, 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 yes and no. To, to, to bring it back to me, mm -hmm. um, you are his primary audience, but you're, but he's thrown in a bunch of Easter eggs for people who are going to mm -hmm. get a whole bunch of other stuff. So when I wrote Thomas the Rhymer, um, it, it's every single thing in it is real folklore. Mm -hmm. And if you know the folklore super deeply, and who does, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get it all and go, ooh, ooh, ooh. But I don't expect people to know it. And mm -hmm. I try to make it a fun read. And it just was really great source material. And yeah. what's really kind of hilarious and embarrassing is when people think I made up the basic stuff which I uh -huh. 
I didn't. And like, oh, God, what's it? I'm like, eh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, I think what I mean by saying I'm not his primary audience, I, so when I was in grad school, my advisor read a draft of Bodies in Motion and said, oh, you're writing this for white people. And I said, what? Mm. And she was like, you're explaining everything. And I was like, I hadn't mm. noticed I was doing it. And I had to go, go back and think about it. And I was like, who do I want to be the primary audience? And mm. so... I, when I wrote the book, rewrote the book, I was writing for my sisters. I want, like, they were the core demographic that I was writing for, um, other Sri Lankan American diasporic, et cetera, of that generation. And if other people got stuff out of it, good, but I, I was prioritizing it being complex and nuanced enough for them. And I think, you know, that there's a bit in Toni Morrison in one of her novels where um, she ended up adding a you know, bird's eye Western white view to the opening of the book showing the, you know, village of poor black people. And she did that because she was worried if you just dropped readers into the midst of it, they would be turned off and confused. And she she felt like she needed a frame. And in the, the interview I read, she, she regretted it later. And yet at the same time, she's not sure that if she hadn't done that, that the book would have succeeded. And so I, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, do you, when you're writing, do you ever write things that are consciously like for Jewish people, for, you know, like where they are in fact your primary audience? Um, and does that, does that change how you approach writing the, the piece? Does that make sense? As opposed to, yeah. you know, so often with authors we're like, I want the biggest audience possible, sure. but. Uh, it, to me, it depends on who I'm, where it's going to be published, if I know. But mm -hmm. but Marianne, let me just say for you, I loved that book. <laughs> I felt like I it's got a, a huge book. amount out of it. And I think part of the reason is because it was layered, nuanced, and made me, like, like great fantasy, uh, like great historicals, it made me go into it and approach it on its terms. Mm. Uh, and if I wanted to know more, I could look it up. I mean, I, and I think when we're kids, what we read, I have a friend who couldn't stand little women because why were they doing those weird things? <laughs> for me, it was mm -hmm. a chance to be in 1865 and, mm -hmm. and, you know, just my temperament was such that as a child, I knew, I didn't understand half of what was going on, but I, I loved that. So that mm -hmm. I think, Marianne, that a lot of people and a lot of science fiction and fantasy readers, that's what we want. We want mm -hmm. that sense that we've been dropped in somewhere where everything is 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 internally coherent and to just follow it around. So, but for somebody like Morrison, you know, yeah, she probably does. It, it was probably a blessing for a lot of her readers and a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a tough call, honestly. I mean, what I, what I ended up trying to do with Bodies in Motion was sort of think of it as as expanding circles. So like, write for my core audience, then mm -hmm. make it as accessible as I could for the next level without compromising the core and then go out from there. So, so, and I, I but, it but was, it's also, it's possible to be too worried about people understanding rather mm -hmm. than experiencing or being immersed. I mean, that's what I'm hearing yeah. Ellen say about when you're a kid, it's like, I don't know what hell's going on, but it's great. Right. And so yeah. in a way it's like, it's like, you know, there's a way of trusting your readership to be like connecting with it, even if they even if they don't get it, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and look, I'm married to a white guy. I live surrounded by white people for the most part, right? So this is mm -hmm. also the community I'm in. If I were writing in, if I were still living in Sri Lanka and surrounded by Sri Lankans, I think I might, you know, I would probably have a different sense of audience, right? And it would change mm -hmm. that a lot. So, you know, it is, you know. We could now talk a lot about your sense of audience and, and where you follow it. I know we're running out of time, so I did yeah. want to, since we were talking a lot about Swords Point earlier, I want to swing this back to that and talk about yes. the, frame, the frame. About the, sorry, I missed the last thing framing. you said. Framing, yes, go, framing. go for it. And, and talk about framing as a way of dealing with the weird stuff. Like, I really mm -hmm. love what you said about Toni Morrison. So <laughs> the beginning of Swords Point is um, snow was falling on Riverside and uh, there's one drop of blood and the, the windows are cracked mm. and everyone, uh, through them you believe there's gonna be evil, but actually it's just regular people and they're not really that evil. So <laughs> I love that and they think it's this, this great, amazing piece of prose that starts off this book. I wrote it at the last minute out of terror mm. because I had a book that really breaks a ton of rules. If, if mm. you read it with an eye to that, every single thing you expect doesn't happen or doesn't mm -hmm. happen when you think it will. And your expectations are constantly being overturned in it. 
And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, oh shit, you know, this book's getting published, but it, it's going to freak people out. I have to find a way to tell them everything you think is going to happen, including that mm. this is going to be a classic fantasy novel or indeed a fantasy novel at all with magic mm -hmm. in it isn't. Yeah. And so I just mm -hmm. in a white heat wrote that open. It, it was really literally written like the week, the week before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, but it's hilarious is a lot of people don't get that it's a, it, that it's a flip and that you're mm. reading little prose and people go, oh, it's, it's I, and the, the thing says, let the fairy tale begin on a winter's morning then. And people go, oh, mm -hmm. this is such a beautiful fairy tale. Missing the next paragraph, which is, <laughs> but none of the fairy tale things apply here. So <laughs> right. that was my frame and it could have been a ghastly mistake, but apparently it wasn't. <laughs> Except for the middle, it's a fairy tale and how they deal with the rest of the book, I do not know. But that is important. The the set initial setting of expectations, like that's you know it, that's the thing we were saying. Sort of you educate the reader, you give them the protocols to yes. to parse what you're what you're giving them potentially. Like you know, but I mean, as you say, Marianne, that's like the balance. Like you can do yeah. that to the extent that it dilutes what you're doing. But yeah, it's um, just being careful. I mean, the the first story in Bodies in Motion I wrote last. I re I had written all the rest of the book, and again was showing it to my advisor, and she was like. I think they could use a little more historical context. Is there any way you could write another story and put it at the beginning <laughs> and like mm -hmm. that will provide yeah. that? And I was like, I went away and I was like, okay, I think I can do that. And I'm really like, it worked out really well, I think um, as a, as yeah. a, so, but I'm also like, I wasn't thinking about that for most of writing the book. It was the literally the last thing I did. And so uh, maybe that is where you should think about audience is at the end like after you've written the book you want to write then go back and think about like okay are there ways I can make this a little more accessible to people or set the reader expectations appropriately or you know um and you know it can be win-win it's not like yeah. a zero-sum game where the more you make it accessible you are necessarily I mean it can it's a danger it's, it's a, a danger pitfall. but but it's possible that the you know you go right. and write the historical thing and that's just great for your sisters you know what I mean yeah, yeah, like yeah. they would just like the historical thing as much as anybody as any other right. part of the book so Yes. You know, okay. it doesn't have to be a trade-off. I could talk to Ellen forever. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, you know, also don't... I started out feeling like, oh, this is the interview where I'm going to lay everything down. And I kind of forgot that the real mandate is let's have a really good conversation about writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Let's, let's do this again because I now I want to just talk to you guys about <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, this is what a lot of what we do is kind of get into the nitty gritty of writing. And so I would love to just do much more of this. I do eventually want to talk to you about sort of like the, the history of the field and various things you've lived with. So maybe maybe when we uh, bring you and Ellen back, you and Delia back, um, we can, maybe we'll hit some of that then. Um, is there any any last things that you didn't, uh, what are you working on now? What should we yeah, point I people to? I'd very much like to, to briefly talk about yes. that. Mm. Um, number one, Jewish stuff. This is hilarious, but I have a Hanukkah book coming out this year. Oh, wow. <laughs> it is the project that will not die. <laughs> it's called Golden Dreidel. What you think? The Golden Dreidel. You already published that book. Yes. yes they changed the spelling and they ah. changed. So it's now the Golden Dreidel, D R E I D E L. Uh -huh. And they've given it with this is my publisher in Boston, Charles Bridge. Um, they've given it a new new illustrations and a new cover mm -hmm. that makes it look much more like a you know contemporary fun kid book. Uh -huh. uh, and this this came about through a strange set of circumstances, but the book itself was not originally a book. It was a live show I did with Shireen Klezmer Orchestra to go with their music for um, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite, which they did as Klezmer. And I wrote a narrative mm -hmm. you know, with it that was the, um, yeah, with, that was basically a Jewish, modern Jewish version of Nutcracker story. Then yeah. it became a radio show, then it became a book. Then I came to New York, somebody read the book and we, I rewrote it as a children's play that played on Broadway, mm. Broadway in 76, but still. Um, <laughs> so it really, and um, my next dream is for it to become a, um, an animated feature. I think it'd be great animated feature. Wow. Music is incredible, yeah. guys do. And so it's, it's going around again for yet another turn. And I need to remember that in many ways I have a new book out. And my big thing now is, you know what? It's great. Uh, this is exactly what you're talking about, Marianne. Yes, it's great for Jewish kids, but please, it's fun for all children. It's a mm. fun fantasy with cool yeah. stuff in it. The chest happens not to be C.S. Lewis, but, you know, my great grandmother. Yeah. Well, and I think with the rise of Odin Voices Lit, where we are seeing a lot more of people actively looking for 
material from different cultures written by people from the culture, which will hope will then be read by everyone, right? I think that is the, the hope and the goal, that it's not going to be ghettoized, that it, it will be broadly read, right? So. You hope so, you hope so. Yeah. And then uh, right now I'm working on yet another Riverside novel. This one about Alex Bastard, daughter of the angriest teenager in the world. And it's mm. really fun and interesting and scary. And I'm just about done with the proposal for my new agent. And I, I hope that people will hate it as much as they like it, because that means it's going to work. <laughs> I, I, I'll say it was just, it, it felt like such a privilege to get to work on, on Tremontaine. I mean, that the first, the weekend we did in New York, where we were all brainstorming together and throwing out ideas was a blast. It was, it was some of the, the most fun I've had. I love that. Um, it, it was then challenging to me to uh to to keep track of everything like it's a complex yeah. thing <laughs> writing writing in serial over many months with a bunch of different people and so i i was i was really sad to leave the project and not stay with it but i i like i couldn't manage the mental logistics of that personally <laughs> right but the but the but the work itself was lovely, and uh, getting getting to play in Riverside was a delight, and so I was just very grateful for that opportunity. And I, I hope I think I had fun with the characters I brought. I hope that other people have had fun playing with them. So. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, this is so great. It's Ellen Waves. That I have a wooden fox letter opener, which I am. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, it's beautiful. From Japan, I love it to death. Um, and I'm toying with it under the table while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but so Marianne, I got to tell you that doing Tremontaine was huge, huge, huge because we very deliberately brought in writers of color for each season right. and we opened up the narrative and opened up the city and the things that you guys brought to it are, are incalculably wonderful for me and I get to keep them. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> When 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 I interviewed for you for it, you were saying, "Can I do something about refugees?" I said, "Oh hell yeah!" So you, you invented <laughs> the country for this fabulous, yeah. beautiful refugee, um, hot hot babe to come from. And it, it was Saren, right? Saren. Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember which, remember I'm either. terrible with names. So yes. I'm pretty sure it's Saren. So Saren is turning up in this. You know, just Yay! Mm, wow. oh my god, I love that. And so. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. It it makes the whole world, you know, so much more present. Yeah. And uh, it's just a huge gift. So thank you. Yay! I, I don't know. I'm I'm I've been toying with the idea of like opening up my sci-fi universe and inviting other people to come play in it. I haven't quite figured out the logistics, but it seems mm. like it could be really a lot of fun. So um, <laughs> we'll see. Well, you know, you, you went through the experience. It's yes. <laughs> ben, any last things you want to say before we sadly let Ellen go? I mean, I liked that last comment you just said about I hope they hate it, hate it as much as they love it. And I think that's very I mean, that it resonates that in a way it's like you kind of want like you don't like like it's almost a more interesting reaction to split the crowd, like to get mm. people stand her up or to get like, you know, rather than everybody just like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know what yeah. I mean? That's it's sort of like maybe this is also a, a very Jewish, uh, <laughs> culturally <laughs> Jewish, but like, like, come argue with me. Don't just tell me it was great. I don't know. So, so, uh, you know, well, arguing really is a, is a, with the Richard and Alec thing, really, because they're people who hate Alec, hate him. <laughs> Do mm. not understand why that fabulous Richard just was this lunatic who treats him so badly. <laughs> and then the people are like, oh, Alec is my messed up boy, and I just love him. And, you know, yeah. so I just discovered, okay, fine, have a good time. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. As I said, I, I want I want to actually give my daughter Swords Point, but I don't want her to use it as a model for her romantic relationships. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like I have to hand it to her with the caveat. But that is actually an interesting thing about kids reading. I mean, what you know, obviously you didn't necessarily intentionally write it for teens, but we've talked a lot about teenagers glomming onto it, and I think there is this hunger for not being given because in fiction, you're you know. You, you don't want them to really do the things, but fiction is actually a safe place to explore, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of fiction for young adults does end up sort of being like infused with adult nervousness about like stay within the lines that we've, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, want, we don't want to tempt you to do things we don't approve of, you know, and so that, you know, but, uh, you know, it's fiction, like there's, there's well, uh, yeah. the reason that my current novel about the angriest teenager in the world 
I think is, well, it's certainly not a YA the way YA is being written now, but I think it's also in some ways for adults is that I'm writing real teenagers. In YA, they are not real teenagers. In my <laughs> book, they change their minds every seven seconds. They cry constantly <laughs> even though they hate it. Do you remember being a teenager? You're like, oh, yeah. Crying and you hate yourself for crying. And um, you know, they're they're wild, they're not entirely sane. Mm. And that to me is But I think there's a hunger for that. I mean, I think that's I think that's uh, you know, if you can habit that from the inside, I mean that's gonna that's gonna I hope ring it works. true. I really do. Yeah. I, I didn't cry all the, I cry much more easily now, but I think I, I was very good at stifling it all as a teenager. So I just shoved it down. <laughs> Well, that is, of course, that we do tend to be like teenagers are like this, but in fact, teenagers yeah. are people who are, if anything, if anything, I often find children, too, are like more, you know, we have, like, it's easy if you're at a remove to be like, oh, children are this way, you know, like children, but actually children have been, had less time to squish them into, like, the general mold, mm -hmm. so actually there's probably more variation, we're just not attuned to seeing it, but, like, when you, whenever, you know, I feel like whenever your kids are, like, precisely a particular age, you're, like, actually paying attention mm -hmm. to that age, and you're like, oh, my God, they're actually, eight-year-olds are some eight-year-olds are <laughs> well, <but laughs> like I, this. I guess what I, guess what I do not. want to say is that, but, that yeah. um, to, to, I didn't really mean to disagree with Ellen because I think that the emotion was there. I just like was very good at, at not expressing it. But the, um, what, what, is, what is missing, I think, from a lot of YA fiction and actually adult fantasy fiction as well, I think, is acknowledgement of trauma and the effects of it, right? And so... Um, people are just super competent. Terrible things happen to them because they're the hero and terrible things are happening to them and they just cope and keep going and they're so strong. And I love, you know, I think this is part of why Murderbot has resonated so much with people. Uh, the latest Martha Wells no novel, Network Effect, just won the Nebula Award last night um, as, as we're recording this. And uh, is because Murderbot is like engaging very, very directly with actual emotion and trauma and what that does to you and how you have to curl up and watch TV for days on end. Um, and I, I, I'm glad to see more of that showing up in fiction. And as, as I am struggling to write my own novel with a teenage protagonist, um, I, I have to resist the urge to make her super competent, you know, like hmm. it's because it's such a trope that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's she's sexually assaulted and like, well, she just keeps going like, no, no, she does not just keep going. Right. Like mm. um, she keeps going. But also what else is yeah. going on? Right. Like, so I, I love that you do that. And I'd like to see more people doing that in in the work. So I don't know. Good luck to you as well. <laughs> I think it, it's chemical. I just that when you're a teen, you're, you're you're you've got chemistry chemicals running through you, and I just I didn't do that stuff when I was ten, and then suddenly here I am, twelve, mm. you know, bursting into tears of rage. Mm. No reason going like what what the hell's going on here, you know? So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, it's so yeah. interesting. Can here. talk to you I forever. Love you guys um, a lot. Thank, Thank you, you for so letting me much. go way the hell over my time. I really oh no no are you kidding? Um, well, so like I said, we you know if I if I had my way, I would take you to a convention and then would lock you in a room for a day afterwards and make okay. you talk to me. So yeah, uh, that's why God made Zoom. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I, really, I love talking to you guys. You know, over lunch, yeah. let alone on a panel, mm -hmm. and um, I just anytime. Anytime, yeah. pick a topic yeah. and you. Yes. My beautiful right. you're saying. All right, thank, thank you. you. Tell Delia um, kisses from us. Yeah, you, it, it sounded like you did amazing, amazing conversation with Delia. I, I was, I, it was great. I love talking to her too. So, um, and I, I was serious about like, I'm gonna draft I, her to help with the teaching. So, okay, I'm gonna stop. And Ellen. And Ellen, yes. I'm gonna stop <laughs> the recording.